In the previous lecture, I characterized postmodernism as a movement that attacks foundations and that attacks truth, or rather, the unity of truth. Just as Nietzsche was a precursor of the postmodernist attack on foundations, so he was also a precursor of the postmodernist attack on truth. And once again, I want to explain this attack by focusing on the writings of Nietzsche. Now remember from the last lecture that Nietzsche writes genealogies, stories about the historical origins of our values, in order to show that those values are not as obvious and self-evident as we tend to believe. We look mostly at moral values in that lecture, but the same holds true for other kinds of values, including scientific or cognitive values. Nothing, for instance, may seem more obvious than that we should value truth, that truth is better than falsehood. But Nietzsche repeatedly asks us why we believe that. Couldn't it be the case that we actually prefer falsehood? That we humans even need falsehood in order to survive? That we couldn't handle the truth if we ever were to find it? I'm going to leave those truly radical questions aside for now. Instead I want to focus on the question of whether we can know the truth. And especially whether we can know the objective truth about what the world is really like. Here, Nietzsche uses biological theories to perform another genealogy. Look at this small aphorism from one of Nietzsche's notebooks. He writes, It is improbable that our knowledge should extend further than is strictly necessary for the preservation of life. Morphology shows us how the senses and the nerves as well as the brain, develop in proportion to the difficulty of finding nourishment. What Nietzsche is saying here is that all human capacities are developed just far enough to be useful for our survival. Our eyes are good enough to see tigers at a reasonable distance and to notice the distinction between a stick and a snake from up close but they are not good enough to see the individual cells of a plant or to see distant galaxies. Why is that? Well, because it is, or at least it used to be, essential to our survival that we could see tigers and snakes, but not, of course, that we could see cells or galaxies. And so it is logical that our eyes have developed as far as they have, but no further. Now, what is true of the eyes, Nietzsche suggests, is surely also true of the brain. Our capacity for thought will have developed just enough to aid our survival, but no further. There is certainly no reason to assume that it has developed far enough for us to know the objective truth about what the world is really like. The idea that we could know the objective truth may seem reasonable if you believe that God has given man his intellect in order to grasp and understand the world. But if you accept Nietzsche's more biological story, then there is no longer any reason to believe that our brains are adequate to this presumably difficult task. So, we shouldn't believe that we can ever know the objective truth. But Nietzsche wants to go further than that. He wants to claim that in fact there is no objective truth. Truth is always and necessarily subjective. He writes, Truth is the kind of error without which a certain species of life could not live. Well, what does that mean? How could truth be a kind of error? Well, Nietzsche says, Language divides the world that we experience into groups of things that are supposed to be the same. The word snake can be applied to lots and lots and lots of experiences, all of which are experience of the same kind of thing, namely a snake. And that's also true for stick and tiger and any other word. But, Nietzsche goes on, 
no two things ever are the same. No two objects are identical. No two experiences are identical. In order for language to function, we first have to abstract away from an infinite amount of detail in order to focus on just a few aspects of reality. We can only say that two things are the same, that they are both snakes, because we ignore almost all the detail about them. In this way then, truth is a kind of error. Truth exists only in language, and language is an abstraction from the world, in which we close our eyes for almost everything in order to focus on just a few details. Now this may remind you of the theories about language and the world that de Saussure defended. And it should, because they have the same underlying idea. The world doesn't have a structure, but language imposes a structure on the world. And Nietzsche, like de Saussure a couple of decades later, believes that different languages can cut up the world in very different ways. Now, Nietzsche wrote that truth is the kind of error without which a certain species of life could not live. That second part has to do with the fact that, of course, humanity had to create languages which made the distinctions that humans need to make in order to survive. Our languages make a distinction between sticks and snakes, because it is essential for us to be able to quickly abstract away from everything else, see that something is a snake, and immediately get out of the way. That happened in prehistory, and it is still happening now. We shape our languages to fit our needs. For instance, when we make a sharp distinction between rebels and terrorists, are we describing a real distinction in the world? Or are we just making a distinction that suits our own political needs? Nietzsche would probably suggest that it is the latter, not the former. So, when we say that truth is a kind of error, that does not mean that there is a better truth somewhere else. A real truth. A truth that would not be an error. Sentences or thoughts are the only things that can be true or false. And they only exist in language. So truth only exists in language. But languages always falsify the world. They always make it simpler than it is in ways that benefit our survival. As physical individuals, as cultural groups and so on. All truth is a kind of error, because all truth is necessarily prejudiced and partial. It is always only my, or at most, our truth. There is a delightful passage in Nietzsche's book The Genealogy of Morals, where he imagines some lambs saying to each other that birds of prey are evil and lambs are good. At which the birds of prey just laugh and reply that they still like the lambs, since nothing is as tasty as a little lamb. The moral, of course, is that the truth of the lambs is not the same as the truth of the birds, because they have a very different perspective on the world. Let's think for a moment about that word perspective. It is one that Nietzsche uses a lot. He calls himself a perspectivalist. He writes that we have finally come to see that it is absurd to stand in your own little corner of the world and claim that only perspectives from that little corner are correct, that they are the objective truth and that all the other perspectives are wrong. You can't judge between these perspectives, Nietzsche would say. You might prefer one or the other for certain reasons, Maybe as a matter of taste, but you can't seriously claim that one perspective is true and the other is false. They all have some claim to validity. And thus the idea of a single objective truth vanishes. And that is precisely what the postmodernist attack on the unity of truth is all about. Still, 
There is something a bit unsatisfying about this metaphor of perspectives. It is obvious that Nietzsche believes that different truths can directly contradict each other. The lambs and the eagles, for instance, or the early Christians and their Roman opponents have exactly opposite ideas about morality. But that is not how perspectives work. If I have one perspective on a mountain and you have another perspective on that same mountain, then we are both seeing a different part of the mountain. And we can combine our perspectives to get a better grasp of the mountain as a whole. So Nietzsche believes that truths can contradict each other, that they can be so opposed that there is no way to combine them. That history, in fact, is often like an arena where different truths fight each other, each other to the death. But perspectives, as we know them from visual experience, can always be combined into a single whole. The metaphor of perspectives, then, is not a very good metaphor for explaining how Nietzsche and the postmodernists really think about truth. In our lecture on Richard Rorty, we will learn about a more apt metaphor for making the postmodernist point about truth. One final note. The attack on foundations and the attack on the unity of truth are, at bottom, the same attack. If there were foundations, fundamental truths that everybody could agree on, then everybody should be able to agree about all the other truths as well, and truth would be one. On the other hand, if there are no foundations, then every claim to truth is always open to criticism and truth will not be one. If you reject one, you have to reject the other as well.